Well, good morning. Good morning. Amen. Hallelujah. I miss Vietnam. I miss 34 Celsius. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know you like Melbourne the way it is. Hallelujah. Let's talk about ambition. Ambition. You know, it's a strong desire to be successful and achieve great things. That's what the dictionary says. Strong desire to be successful and achieve great things. You know, often we think of that word as being a secular word, a word that describes business and, and so on and so on. I think it's just a neutral word. You know, without it, much doesn't happen in the kingdom. Again, I believe the Lord wants to take our sanctification and sanctify it. Or excuse me, take our ambition and sanctify it for the Lord. You know, Paul describes the purpose of ambition for the Christian. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, we have this as our ambition. Whether at home <clears throat> or absent, we're to please the Lord. So again, Paul was an ambitious guy, and so was uh, his disciples. But they turned their ambition to God. You know, the only way I can please God is by walk by faith, to walk by hearing, to, to what are you saying to me right now, God? And then to walk it out. So I believe ambition is included in the new birth. We all have some of that. But am I turning it to the Lord? I work with heroin addicts in the north of Vietnam. Kind of a funny story, because I did drugs before Moses was here. I mean, many, many years ago. <laughs> I was never really a drug addict, but they think I was. And I, I sold drugs and used drugs and ran drugs across the Mexican border <coughs> for the U.S., um, even though I was a university student, and um, got into some different things. And so about 10 years ago, uh, I got a call from a Vietnamese pastor I did not know. And he said, you probably don't remember me, but he said, 10 years ago, uh, you prayed for me, and I was dying of cancer, stomach cancer. I was on an IV drip and couldn't eat food, and, uh, and he said, I was healed that night. I walked out of there, went to a restaurant, took her out the restaurant, had dinner, and he said, I've been healed ever since. I got a wife, got two kids, I got three church plants, got two drug centers. Would you come and help me? I thought, excuse me. I said, well, I'd like to come see you just to see who you are. So, I, you know, sometimes you pray for something like that, you know, you never just think about it, and you find out years later. Anyway, so he said, would you help me work with these drug addicts, heroin addicts here? And I said, why would you ask me? I mean, I could be their grandfather, right? Almost. And uh, he said, well, you have victory. You did drugs. You did this, you did that, right? He said, yeah. But that was, you know, B.C., so many years ago. <laughs> I can't even remember I did that stuff, honestly. Honestly, it feels like I'm making up a story. He says, well, these guys need role models. They need somebody that's been there. They've done it. So I says, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll agree to meet with them once or twice, but I don't think they'll listen to me, and, and that's okay. I understand, because uh, they're just 20, 21 years old, 22, and, uh, and they're Vietnamese. I need my wife to interpret for me, and um, the North doesn't like the South. And I live in the South part of Vietnam. My wife is absolutely South Vietnamese. And uh, so on, so on. So anyway, I went there, and these guys were sitting on the floor, and uh, they would not leave the meeting. At break time, they didn't want to go nowhere. They said, we didn't want to miss the next thing you have to say. So it was like, pfft. I felt like I was feeding the multitudes, but it wasn't the multitudes, it was about 25, 30 guys. They were eating out of my hand. And, and, and God said, some of these guys I'm going to call to the ministry. I want you to plug into them. I want you to pour. To me, discipleship is pouring into somebody else what God has poured into you through somebody else. Amen. It's not yeah. just reading somebody's book. Good. Yeah, hallelujah. So I told those guys, listen, um, we're light years ahead. I'm a different culture, the whole thing. But if I can help you guys, we're here. And so uh, without any promotion or advertising, that kind of a thing at all, uh, another situation developed, another situation developed, and I found myself working in five drug centers coming together for three meetings twice a year. And uh, so the last time I was there was, was very recently. They asked a key guy, they says, how often would you like Paradise to come back here? They said, every three months. And the, the, the director looked at them and looked at me and I said, uh-uh, it ain't going to happen. Um, but um, they said, when you're here, it's reality time. It's reality time. We have a lot of guys that come in here and say Bible survey, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da, and praise God for that stuff. And so, uh, so anyway, um, having a good time helping some, some of the guys are now in ministry. And if I get 1%, I told those guys, I'll give you everything I got, but I want a 1% reward when I go to heaven. I get 1% of your stuff. I said, that's cheap. How about two? So I go back to Myanmar, where I'm doing stuff in the north. And somebody has not talked to somebody, but suddenly they say, you ever work with drug addicts? 
why would you ask me that in Myanmar? Because 80% of our guys in the Kachin state, 80% like California, from age 15 to 44 are addicted to heroin. And it's, the, the government of Myanmar is so pathetically sick that they shoot up guys in shooting galleries, I've got pictures, shoot one after another heroin, 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 then put them in jade mines where the mines collapse and kill some of them and so on and so on. It's just a demonic thing. So they said, can you help some of our guys out? We're going to put together and do this and do this and this. And I said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm learning how to do it over in Vietnam. I want to make it work. I'm, I'm a church planner. What am I doing with these heroin addict kind of guys? But God said, that's the need here. So just become all things to all men. And I go back to when I first came to the Lord and uh, drugs had messed me up and uh, uh, my a loose lifestyle had messed me up. And I had about this much ambition. Uh, and it took a little while to get the wheels turning. Some people just take off like a rocket ship. My older brother, um, he was saved one month and he was doing international stuff. And uh, I was always introduced as the younger brother. And what are you doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're a Christian too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, thanks. And my brother was not a proud guy or nothing like that at all. But I was insecure. And I didn't have a relationship with dad and so on and so on. But uh, little by little, some ambition kind of got going there in the kingdom. The more I fed on the Word of God, and as my brother was sharing this morning, got into helping people, whether it's one people, two people, whatever, I just felt the <clears throat> wheels turning. Ambition, uh, desire to be successful, achieve great things. You know, Jesus was the most ambitious person there ever was. Uh, focused in prayer and the Word, facing frequent temptation, Active in ministry, disciple 12 men all the way to the cross. Jesus was ambitious. All the 12 disciples had ambition, even if it was a selfish nature. We often choose future leaders on the basis of servanthood, but that's not what the Lord did, actually. He looked prayerfully for the most ambitious men he could find, prayerfully, and he chose those people. Because people that lack ambition, you can't do nothing to change them. They can go to all your classes and they remain the same. People that are all weirded out, but they come to Christ and they have ambition. If it can be turned to the Lord, you can fly with those guys. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So, you know, Jesus chose a tax collector, four commercial fishermen, Simon the Zealot, which was a terrorist, and a thief to be his 12. Yeah. So Jesus can look for ambitious men, prayerfully. And as you know, in Luke 9, 46, it says, The 12 argued among themselves as to who would be the greatest ambition. And as you know, Jesus did not rebuke them for their ambition, but said the way to get there is to serve and be humble, but absolutely to go up. When I first uh, came back from one-year Bible school, I thought I was going to change my world. So I went to an Assembly of God uh, meeting because they needed some new pastors, guys were retiring and things like that, and I thought, I'll be one of them. So uh, when they looked at my resume that had nothing on it, um, but I said, a one-year Bible school graduate certificate, you know? So they did not get impressed by that at all. And uh, they needed guys, but they weren't that desperate. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just thought, you know, I dressed up real nice the whole thing, and I thought, these guys are missing a great opportunity. I didn't realize I had some pride. Um, so I went to other churches, you know, and did the same thing, and I got nowhere. Finally, this one guy from an evangelical church, he said, you know what, son, I believe that God has sent you to my church, and I want to put you on staff. <laughs> Finally, somebody get with the program. So I'm just trying to be humble and smile. Um, and uh, I thought he probably wants me to be the youth pastor. That would be a good starting point, you know, or assistant pastor, you know, and a church of about 200. And uh, so I was stupid enough to just agree. I said, well, look, I'll do it. I'll do it. He said, great, follow me to the bathroom. To the bathroom. So anyway, he said, here's the brushes. Here's where the toilets are. And I thought to myself, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, I'm a university graduate. Hello, hello. I didn't say that to him, of course. Uh, I, I have a Bible certificate from da 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 and so I had to pretend like I was happy. But I thought, I can't, I've never cleaned the toilet in my life, you know? <laughs> and uh, what am I doing here? So, um, so one day I was uh, complaining about whatever in an empty sanctuary, something like this, but a lot more seats. And uh, the Lord says, uh, change your attitude, son, or don't even dream of the ministry. Uh, so one day I had a broom, and I was sweeping something or other, and Oh, suddenly I just imagined something that a lot of people all filled up and I'm preaching through the broom, you know. I think the Lord was ministering there. I felt anointed. Uh, I don't know if it was any good. Uh, but I heard the Lord say, okay, back to work. 
But this church was packed out when I was doing this broom preaching. And uh, what I didn't know is God was giving me a vision for the future. Amen. If I was never called to be a preacher, I'd be happy in the Lord because my self-worth comes from who I know, not what I'm doing. That's right. But at the same time, I know we're saved to serve in, in a literal Amen. good sense of the word. Hallelujah. If I'm not helping somebody get me out of here, let's go home. Yeah. So uh, I learned back in those days to serve God with faith. To say, God, I'm sweeping right now, and I'm going to praise you in it, but this is not where I'm going to stay. This is the first rung of the ladder, because you saved me to go up the rung to help people, more influence, and so on and so on, for your kingdom. You determine how much I can serve and who I can help and how many I can help. I'm not into numbers, I just, but I'm, I, I've been saved. I've been transformed, just like you have been. So again, these 12 argued among themselves as to who would be number one, who would be top guy. And so God, God who birthed those men into the kingdom, and who through birth and through their mother, they were born with some ambition. And, and they, they wanted to, and Jews, I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood. I'm a Catholic, former Catholic. All my best friends were Jews. And these guys were driven. Their parents were driven. I mean, you have to be a concert pianist on top of a football player, on top of the best student in the class. They don't know what lazy is. So, you know, when Jesus was talking to the mother of James John, and she said, you know, when you come into your kingdom, I want my son to sit on the right and the left. Uh, and again, he did not rebuke her for the ambition, but said, that's not my job to determine who, who sits there. But there were 12, there are thrones up there, and these guys would sit on some of them. So it said the other 10 were upset, and they were upset because they wanted to be on the throne too. Literally, virtually. Yeah, they were looking for position up there. So again, I, I felt like the Holy Spirit in my early developments as a Christian and continues to challenge me along the same lines, saying, serve me with faith, meaning having vision to see yourself go up or, or out or whatever you want to call it, to see more influence coming out of your life uh, for the kingdom. A, a natural, healthy ambition mixed with faith moves us forward. You know, Rahab had an ambition. She was a key to taking Jerusalem, um, excuse me, Jericho. And she was a risk taker, which is often required to become a person of faith. Are you a risk taker? Often when we first come to Christ, that's just part of the game. I mean, just, we, just, we just naturally risk or nothing. But as you get a little bit older and you get more whatever, and you've been a senior pastor perhaps or something of that nature, you know, you just, you, you have to remember whens. I remember when God did this. Remember that kind of thing. And, and I, I just go, how about now? How about what's, what's the thing God wants to do next? The next thing. I was in a home meeting in California that I was supposed to be the speaker, but it looked like somebody else was the speaker that night by God's design. And this was an 83-year-old lady that I didn't know named Heidi. And so uh, she said, God gave me a burden a couple years ago to reach uh, troubled youth in Sacramento, California, in our worst facility for youth. These are all rapists and murderers only, those two crimes. And so she said, I live near the prison, and... Uh, I went and applied to be able to come and speak to the chaplain thing on Sunday. They said, no way, no way, get out of here, get out of here. She kept, went back to the prayer closet at 83, and uh, she went back and says, look, you, you can't deny me to do an application. She said, no, we can't, we're sorry, okay, you can fill out the form, but be realistic, you know. And uh, so one Sunday, man, God, you know, came down for her. Uh, whoever was supposed to speak didn't come, and they had 15 minutes left. So they said, look, if you can be over here in 15 minutes, you got your, your, your dream here. So there were about 30 young guys there. They did not want to meet Christ. That's not why they came to the meeting. They came for coffee, donuts. They have to listen to the speaker. So when they saw this 83-year-old woman walk in with a cane, they went, off, they went ballistic. So they're just laughing and laughing. And the sheriff said, you shut your mouth. You, oh, you shut your mouth. You're going back to your cell. They're in lockdown. And you, you respect this lady. So they're just kind of slouched back like this kind of a thing, like lowriders from wherever, L.A. or something. <laughs> um, and uh, she, she preached for five minutes, and the power of God just dropped like a rocket ship. Fourteen men fell to their knees uh, with no manipulation, gave their hearts to Christ, wept their way into the kingdom, repented big time. And I thought, so when I heard her share, I said, if you can do that with an 83-year-old woman with a cane, I guess you still have more stuff for me out there. Hallelujah. I felt jealous. I felt jealous. Of, where'd you get this compassion for these kids, you know? I, I, wanna, I don't know about you, but I want to grow in compassion for God. Yeah. Compassion and faith, because faith works through love. Amen? Yeah. The more you love on people, real love, you know, agape, faith's going to follow. Hallelujah. Stuff's going to happen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's right. 
Yeah. So again, a former prostitute, when Rahab married in faith, uh, we know that Jesus came out of the bloodline. And her name in Hebrew means wide. And often God's plan and purpose for your life and my life, your ministry and my ministry, is larger than when we first begin. And it's not that big is better. I'm, I'm more into quality kind of stuff. But I mean, no matter how much quality you want, you, you need numbers. You need numbers. You've only got two people and you fail with both guys, you've got nothing. If you have a thousand guys and you make success with 20, you praise God, you've got 20. Yeah. yeah. Often God's purpose for you and for me is wider than when we first knock on the door. When I found, you know, I'm running the church of 50 people, as I said last week, you know, trying to get up to 51, the magic number. <laughs> and this indigenous brother, First Nation Indian, a big guy, almost 280 pounds, muscle kind of guy, walks in with a full cross, Arthur Blessed style, puts it next to my wall on Sunday night service, says, my name is Ed LaRose, kind of intimidating kind of guy. And I said, great. He said, God told me to join your church. I said, great. And so... Um, he started challenging me for evangelism. And he said, uh, I just came back from Vietnam. I'm the first preacher from the West to come into Vietnam since 75. The year was 89. He said, I told those guys I'd bring a pastor back. Will you come with me? So I thought, me? Me, 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 me? I said, I'm, I'm not into missions. I'm not against missions, of course, because that's a sin, of course. But I said, you know, <laughs> but I said, I'm a California pastor with 50 people. I like pizza and all the other kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, but he, he was just bold in my face. And he said, are you going to go or not? So then I used my next song. I said, I don't have money to fly to Vietnam. <laughs> he said, I'll, I'll use my faith to get the money to pay for your air ticket. Will you go? Now I'm cornered. I said, well, um, all right. All right, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I thought, I watched Vietnam War and the movies, you know, and that kind of stuff, you know. I'm going to go see what happened there. I was supposed to fight in the war, but I had flat feet from surfing all summer. So uh, I failed my physical, which was heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, heartbreaking. So I was an anti-communist with a capital A. I was nuke those guys, <laughs> nuke those punks, take them off the map. So I walk in there with this brother, and it was high-tech, over-the-top Soviet domination. It was underground church that was really underground, underground. And I had the best time of my life the next eight to ten days. And I found myself running from the cops and hiding and crawling across fields on my belly, jumping from rooftop to rooftop to not get caught, um, and, uh, and seeing miracles take place. And I, I'd only read about the miracles in the New Testament, and I saw a few. When a blind man said, I can see again, I can see again for 10 years, I gave him a Bible, he started reading his Bible. He was blind as a bat. Wow. So I came back and said, how can I ever be a pastor again? How can I go back to the 50, trying to get to 51? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I thought, and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me when I got on the plane near Vietnam, and he said, someday, not soon, you'll live in Vietnam. I thought, hmm, interesting. So I went back and I tried to do the church, and I, I have nothing but great respect for senior pastors and, and staff on churches. I believe in pastors huge. Um, but the Lord said, um, the truth is, Paradise, you're not a pastor. I've got a card from the Assembly of God that says I am. It's, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's not true at all. You are not really a pastor. You don't like counseling people with their marriages. You get upset with them. You know, after the third time, they don't straighten out their marriages saying, get with it, you know, kind of a deal. <laughs> says, you know, says, what are you doing back here again? We don't have an appointment this week. And just, you, want, you like to preach, but you don't like to shepherd. And he says, you're really not a pastor. You, you're a missionary in, in the making. But just the way that God would bring that individual into my life. And he said, I hate white people until I just got saved recently. He was sitting in a hotel in Sacramento. A major drug deal. He's got a gun strapped over here that he's used before. Turns on the TV with a remote. And there's a guy preaching out of somewhere in Virginia. And he's trying to flick it off. And he's, he's effing the guy off, effing the guy off. Who's, why won't this thing shut off? And the guy says, there's a man sitting on a bed in Sacramento, California, right now in a hotel. And this is what you're saying right now, and this is what you're doing. God has a call on your life. Get down on your knees and give your heart to Christ. He got saved right there. Within a month, he was carrying a cross with Arthur Blessed. And then, a short time later, he's in my little place. So he said, you're going to help me carry the cross in Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City. I said, have you flipped? <laughs> have you flipped? And then he said, you afraid? Um, kind of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of, you know. I said, I didn't come here to go to jail right away. Um, but, but I had my turn. And I thought, for whom the sun sets free is free indeed. 
So I came back, I started dreaming about Vietnam, and I went as often as I could get a visa. And when I got kicked out in 1994, um, and I went to the Lord and complained and so on and so on, the Lord said, you're, you're not called to a nation, you're called to a region. And I figured, Lord, I got one year Bible school, la 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 la. I went to university, so what? Um, I've got no missionary training, I don't speak Vietnamese, I'm a terrible missionary, I don't even like some of their food, <clears throat> but I love the people. That qualifies me. <clears throat> so the Lord said, I, I, I worked for you to get kicked out of Vietnam, so you have to go into Cambodia. And then step by step in Cambodia, I came into Myanmar, and from Myanmar I ended up going to the mountains of Nepal. And my last shot is North Korea. Um, ambition. I'm not into chasing nations. I'm not into counting where, how many places I've been to. That's nothing to me, nothing. I'm happy to do whatever God says, just like you are. But I believe that God has put an ambition there in saying, <clears throat> I want to use each one of these men here and women here and use myself as well to influence the circles of things that we do in the kingdom. We may be doing something very small right now or something that's not small. Be faithful with that small thing. It's going to move forward. And we're not in competition with one another, that's for sure. <clears throat> I'm sitting in a hotel doing buffet breakfast in Myanmar some years back. And an Australian, I've never met an Australian in my life, and uh, I know there are some people from Australia, and so, but I know the accent. So he says, hey mate, sit down and have breakfast with us. And So uh, my wife and I sat down with him, and he said, I'm doing uh, orphanage work over here. How about you? No, I'm not doing orphanage work. So anyway, he uh, went after me and invited me to come to Melbourne, and I, I quickly declined. Six months later, he's in the same hotel I'm in again, he says, remember me? He says, yeah, my name is Peter. And, and he says, uh, why don't you come preach at my church? And I said, no, thank you. And so that was that. Six months later, the guy's tracking me. He's there in the same hotel again, 18 months now. And so he invited me again. And I said, you know, I don't have a burden for Australia. He said, I didn't ask you to have a burden. I just asked you to preach at my church, have a vacation. I said, I don't do vacations. So he said, what is with it? Will you go to your room and pray about it and then come back here in 20 minutes? I said, all right, I will. So I went to him. I said, Jesus, you know, I don't believe you want me to go to Australia, la, 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 la. But this pastor put a little pressure on me here, and so just, just give me a word here so I can go down and tell him no, you know. So to my shock, God said, go with this guy. I said, you've got to be kidding. I mean, it's not a third world country, to say the least. You could buy America, you know, because <laughs> we got so much debt, <laughs> you know. I figured, so I said, well, the Lord seemed to say yes. So uh, he got excited. <clears throat> and about two days before I went to Australia, I opened up my email and Google Alerts where I've got everything that comes in on the Khmer Rouge of Cambodia. And there was an article there that was not about the Khmer Rouge, but it was about a Maoist insurgency going on in Nepal. I thought, what's this doing in my email? I deleted it without looking at it. The next day it came in again, opened it up, talked about this guy that was indirectly discipled by Pol Pot, Prachanda. So I thought, what is this doing in my email? So forget it. I get it in Thai Airways at Bangkok. She, the stewardess gives me a newspaper on the front page is a, a big picture of a riot going on in Nepal somewhere. So I ripped it off and said, what's this all about? Hmm. So I get to Melbourne Airport, and the brother and his wife pick me up, and said, so let's go out and have some chicken, walk by a place called Kathmandu Sporting Goods. Just saw a sandwich board. I thought, it must be an Aboriginal name, Kathmandu, strange name. But the Holy Spirit seemed to speak to me, I'm eating chicken. He says, that's the capital of Nepal. So that night I went on the internet, and sure enough it is. Hmm. Next morning I get up to pray, 5.30 in the morning, get my shoes there, in the house I'm staying below the bookshelf. And right above my shoes was a cassette series of Nepalese, the language of Nepal. I asked Peter, Pastor Peter, I said, Peter, do you know anybody in Nepal? He says, no. I says, where's this from? He says, I don't know where this came from. So uh, my wife woke up a little bit later, and I said, I'm going to Nepal. You're going to where? I said, Nepal. Where is that? I said, I think it's near Tibet, I think. Well, who do you know there? I said, nobody. What will you do there? I said, I have no clue. <laughs> Well, when we, last question, when will you go? I said, probably April 4th. How would you know that? I just know, April 4th. Can't go before then because of this, can't go after then because of this, April 4th. Now, I wish I was that spiritual all the time. But, but anyway, I was spiritual at that morning at least. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so uh, I went to Pastor Peter, got very spiritual over breakfast, said, do you know anybody in Nepal, la, 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 la. He said, zero to all the other stuff. So we went back to Vietnam. The next day when I got into Vietnam, I had an email, and Pastor Peter says, you're going to get an email from so-and-so, so-and-so from uh, City Life Church. And uh, he said, this guy just called me up, does orphanage work. I didn't know him from Adam. 
came over here. We talked about orphanage work in Nepal and Myanmar. And I talked to you about you. And so he's going to send you an email. So the next day, Stephen Teo, this Singaporean guy, says to me, I have got you invited to go to Nepal. And um, we're going to meet so-and-so, so-and-so. I told my wife, see? So a couple days later, this guy sends me this email. And he says, brother, I'm real busy over here right now, but Stephen Taylor asked me to accommodate you. I could tell he wasn't excited to have me come, and that's okay. I'm a stranger, and la, la, la. He said, the only time I can see you is April 4. So I showed up on April 4, and uh, within a short time, I was talking to the number five Maoist leader in a secret location during the war zone. And it was like the Khmer Rouge revisited, but a higher end up thing. And I thought, oh, God, ambition is moving me forward. Ambition is helping me to touch some additional people besides the one I'm already teaching. To the glory of God alone. I'm nobody. You know, he's everything. That's the whole issue there. Amen. Yeah, I'm not into self at all. Hallelujah. But like we said last night, when I'm weak, then am I strong. And God's attracted to our weakness. You know, King David, in 1 Samuel 17, we know his story well. 24, 25. David comes to bring cheese and bread to his uh, brothers. And he over here is the guy's conversation. Whoever kills the giant gets the following reward. And so when David hears this, he said, would you repeat that again? <laughs> and then when he do the second time, a third time, would you repeat that one more time? He says, yeah, you get the beautiful daughter, the king will enrich you tax-free on the money, and you can knock down that punk giant too for the glory of God. So if you, if you ask, why did David fight the giant? Three reasons for himself, one for God. And God said, I'll take you to where you are. I'll work with your ambition and turn it toward the Lord. I mean, that's really the way it comes down. We're, you know, we, if we're not careful, we can make David into something higher than he was. He was just an ordinary man like you and me. Amen? Had a heart for God. That's because of God. But again, you know, his motives were mixed. His motives were mixed. You know, when I first came to Christ. I didn't come to Christ because I loved Jesus so much. I came to Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to get off drugs and so on and so on. But, but step by step, you know, God turns our heart. So David had ambition. To, and his ambition to conquer Goliath was greater than his fear. Nobody, you know, this should have been Saul's battle for sure, somebody else's battle, not David's. So God had put ambition in David. And when we compare him to King Saul, King Saul had a no plan, no plan. After he fought a battle, he went back to farming. That is not what you do as a king. Kings are not farmers anymore. But David, as you know, uh, designed a plan to make Jerusalem a capital. They had no capital he had a standing army. Saul had no army at all. And then David drew the plans up for the temple, even though he didn't construct it. So, you know, ambition in your life and my life will move us forward in our walk with God personal, in our marriages, if we are married, and in our ministry. I always want to be moving forward. Even if I'm moving at the pace of a turtle, I want to be moving forward. Amen? Amen. I don't want to stand still and go backwards. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Not bragging on self, that kind of stuff, but I dragged my body up high mountains in Nepal. I mean, a couple times I've almost fallen to my death. And it's just, uh, it's dangerous kind of stuff. But the people are up there. And I go there to, I, I probably go there for myself, in a sense, as well as for the people, just to say, I care. I care for your poverty. I care for your nothing you got here. You know, and I just, what, I'm, I didn't come to do an air con conference down at the bottom. There's nothing wrong with that kind of stuff. There's no air cons, no power there anyway. But I said, we just come to say, you know, Jesus cares, we care, we're up here in the mountains with you, and we are going to do this and do that uh, to the glory of the Lord. And I've married a great wife that drags her body up the mountain, too, with me. Yeah, hallelujah. You know, at the edge of the Red Sea, in Exodus 14, 15, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Move forward. That's his words, move forward. I mean, it's the only time in the Bible I can find where somebody gets rebuked for praying. It was not a time to pray. There's a time, it sounds spiritual. I love to pray. You see me walking around here like a coyote. Um, I just, because I, I like praying in tongues a lot. Especially if I'm the speaker. <laughs> you know all the help I can get. You know, ambitious people are concerned about moving forward. Again, I'm talking about ambition that's turned toward God. Turned toward God. Yeah. Not hyperness and that kind of thing. <clears throat> you know, it says in Isaiah 58, 8, The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. That means there's no armor. The armor's up here. It's not for back here. God has no plan to go backwards uh, for you or for me. Hallelujah. You know, Numbers 11, <clears throat> when God said to Moses, to make it easier on you, I'm going to take some of your spirit and put it on 70 elders. So go out to the tent and do what I tell you. 
And uh, he didn't count well that day because only 68 guys showed up. But it looked like 70. So uh, they, they, they prophesied and things were fine. It was a great Pentecostal meeting. It was short-lived. Um, and they never prophesied again. Just went back and watched TV or whatever they did. Uh, but Joshua finds out two of the guys didn't show up and they're prophesying among the people, as uh, Phil was saying earlier, among the people, not in just the church. And so Joshua says, you know, stop them, Moses. You know, we're the, we're the big guns here. You know, it's, it's you and me. But I love Moses, and he said, man, I wish all the servants of God would prophesy. I wish all could preach. You know, I tell these guys that are drug addicts, I tell these people up in the mountains and they pump, I want you to preach better than me. I want you to heal better than me. I want you to disciple better than me. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'll invest in my life, but I expect you guys to do a better job than me. I'm not some insecure thing where I've got to be head honcho. Forget yeah. that stuff, you know. No way, Jose. Hallelujah. Good. So again, Moses had ambition to see the kingdom expanded. Hallelujah. Again, wanting to be successful in life and achieve or accomplish great things. Othniel. You know, Othniel was Caleb's son-in-law. And again, uh, Caleb had said, anybody that defeats this group up here in the mountain, they get my beautiful daughter. So it sounded like a David thing again. He said, she looks pretty good to me. So this young man who could fight uh, said, I'll bring glory to Israel, and uh, I get the pretty girl too. Mixture there, mixture on his ambition. And so Othniel had the victory, and he became the first judge. He didn't stop there. He became the first judge of Israel. His name says it all. His name means Lion of God. I mean, what kind of parent would give a child a name, Lion of God? You know, a lion doesn't know what the word passive means, you know? It lives to eat people, or whatever it does, you know? They, they say scientifically that when a lion roars, he puts his face to the ground, actually, contrary to the movies, and it sends out a vibration in eight miles in all directions. It sends fear into all, all yeah, the other guys out there. Lion of God. So again, I see this guy, he started off with, I'll knock those giants down or whoever's up in the city, and I'll get the beautiful daughter. But it didn't stop there. Yeah. You know, and it's our turn. It's our turn every day to be ambitious for God. Yeah, hallelujah. Ambitious to serve other people mm. by the Spirit of God as we're led by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Ambitious servants and saints are always increasing their spiritual inheritance. Yeah, I want more for God, not for me. I want more for God. Amen. Of course there's selfish ambition, you know, and, and, and James wrote about that. Welcome to life. Uh, but I'm not too worried about selfish ambition because if Jesus is Lord, my ambition is going to be turned toward God. You know, start with something small for God and go forward. Zechariah 4, 10. He was despised the day of who is despised the day of small things. Again, back to broom time for me, from preaching in the broom to to doing the stuff that we currently do, uh, and being faithful, you know, and having a vision to see uh, my ambition moving forward up to the Lord. And then Ecclesiastes nine ten, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. So if I'm doing a small thing, I know God's looking over my shoulder. He's looking over my shoulder and watching how I'm doing that thing. And if I want to please God uh, and, and do it as unto the Lord, um, it's going to happen and more opportunity is going to come. You know, a person can be full of character flaws and weaknesses, but if they have ambition, a leader can work them out. I don't care how goofed up people are. If they have ambition, we can help them move up. Hallelujah. If a person lacks ambition, there's nothing you can do to change them. There's nothing you do. Yeah, hallelujah. Sometime, it sounds pathetic. A good thing to do is to let them backslide. Sounds horrible. Let them backslide. Let them really meet God. Because that's, that's what's missing in their life. Yeah. Because you can only do so much as a leader to try to encourage somebody that's not doing their own homework. Because I always tell people, maybe it sounds legalistic, I say, you've got to do your own homework, man. You've got to drag your body up and make yourself pray. Yeah, you've got to do it. I'm not going to call you at 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, come on, wake up, smell the coffee. Um, there's no free rides in the kingdom. Yeah, I, I preach that all the time. Because, you know, there's, there's laziness out there in the church sometime and so on, so on, so on, so on. Again, if a person lacks ambition, there's not much we can do to motivate them. And so I, I believe it's essential 
uh, to be in leadership at any level, we have to be ambitious. You know, who are your friends? Who do you fellowship with? We're called to love everybody, including our enemies. But I get to choose my friends. I get to choose my close friends. And so the kind of friends that I, I have that are closest are Proverbs 27, 17, friends, where it says, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. So I'm not looking for people that have the same kind of ministry I got, or they're missionaries, or whatever the kind of a deal is. I don't, they don't have to be my age level. Um, people that are ambitious for God and are for real, are for real. Um, those kind of people, we sharpen each other in the Lord. We push each other up, you know. And I, I've got all kind of people that pray for me and say, hey, pray for me. I'll pray for you too. Um, and just, uh, yeah, iron sharpens iron. As much as I like a vertical relationship with Christ, I need the body of Christ. I need other brothers and sisters that are ambitious for God, that are zealous for God, that have fire in their spirit, not just hype. Well, and, uh, you know, men who, who, not can, who can pray me through uh, sometime when I'm a, going through a struggle. And, and vice versa. Hallelujah. Ambitious for God. You know, Saul of Tarsus was pregnant with ambition. That's the way I describe it, pregnant with ambition. You know, his conversion is spoken in three times, Acts 22, Acts 26, Acts 9. And it's repeated three times because God wants us to look at what a conversion looks like, what a real New Testament conversion looks like. Yeah. Too many people have prayed sinners' prayers and haven't changed. Yeah. But when a man or woman has been converted, I don't mean perfect, but converted, repented for square A, you know, hallelujah, not seeker sensitive model. Um, uh, yeah, Paul, Paul is right there. And so, you know, at the moment of his conversion, once he's identified who he's persecuting, that, that voice up in heaven says it's Jesus. Paul's next thing is um, <clears throat> where should I go to church? Where should I start reading the Bible? No, his first question is, once he knows who's talking to him, is, what shall I do? <clears throat> I mean, what a wild question to ask the guy's been saved 30 seconds. What shall I do? And, of course, God said, you're, you're just a baby here. Hello, uh, go and find a good pastor and praise God for good pastors. Get into church, it's a good thing. But he said, I will go to Damascus and I'll show you exactly what you shall do. I thought, God gave him that faith, right, to ask that kind of an audacious question uh, moments into his conversion. So as you know, Ananias is sent to go and prophesy over him, heal his eyes, and get him baptized in the Holy Ghost. And so specifically, here's your call. Here's what you told God, and here's what God wants to say to you. You're called to preach to Gentiles, to Jews, the latter part of your ministry, to kings, and then don't forget, you're going to suffer much for the name of the Lord. Yep, you're going to suffer much. Get going, man. Get going. And so it says immediately Paul began preaching the gospel. Now he had an advantage way over most of us. I mean, he knew his Bible backwards and forwards. He just didn't know who the Messiah was. Once the lights came on, it was like, kaboom, I can do this. And he was real. Um, not fair, not fair. So it's, it, says, uh, it says Paul got real fervent and the Jews made a plan to kill him. They loved trying to kill this guy. Uh, and so they guarded the gate so Paul had to be put over the basket in the, in the wall there. The thing that's interesting there it says in the New American Standard Version, his disciples lowered him in the basket. So after 30, 40 days, he's already making disciples. It's not fair. Again, yeah, yeah, I know many believers that have never made a disciple at all. Zero, never. They've never led anybody to Christ. 95% of Americans have never led anybody to the Lord that are born again. Wow. Sick, sicko. Hallelujah. And I'm no evangelist guy, but I can do some of that as you can and see people come to the Lord. If I didn't, I'd quit tomorrow. So, I, I'm, I'm not Paul, those, though I admire this guy big time. But I see his ambition when turned to the Lord uh, was rocket ship time. It, it changed the church. Um, even secular scholars will say, he, next to Jesus, he changed the church. He changed the world through church work more than anybody on the planet. Yeah. So through ambition that sanctified and turned to the Lord. We take back what the enemy's ripped off. Through ambition, we make ourselves get up early if that's our style, right? To just crank before God, you know, to, to, to just break through for God, amen? To hear God's voice afresh. I mean, both the listening and to hear you, and then to just go launch and vertical. To take authority over whatever the situation happens to be. And, and just by His grace and mercy, with the help of other good brothers and sisters, to uh, move the church forward. Yeah. To move forward what we're doing in the Lord. So again, if, if you know, I don't know how you're doing this early afternoon here with ambition. Um, how ambitious are you? Are you honestly ambitious for God?
can you prove it to yourself? If you're not, I believe God's here to help us. If you need more ambition, I believe God's here to help us. Hallelujah. Amen. Again, it's not a personality type. It's not a hype thing. I'm hype, but that's just my flesh. Um, but, it's, it, but, but an ambition that God has put in our spirit, man, to serve the Lord and to serve other people. Yeah, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we just look to God, Lord. Lord, we, we believe that Jesus was full of ambition right now. He, he did just what he did here. He did it all as a man. He did it as a man in relationship to the Father in heaven. And we are in the same position of Christ here, Lord. I mean, we're not the Redeemer, but we're sons of the Most High God. Uh, and Father, you said as many as are led by the Spirit, they're God's sons. And that's us right now. Hallelujah. We all have some mistakes. We all have some weaknesses. Praise the Lord. But then we have you. Oh, Lord, you are our ambition. Hallelujah. And, and Lord, I, I pray that you'd grace us with fresh ambition. We'd stir up the ambition of God in our life, Lord. Yes. Father, and uh, we would just uh, move forward, Lord, at whatever pace you determine, Lord. Hallelujah. For our life and our ministry, our marriage, our walk with God. Uh, I pray, uh, Lord, you'd make us dissatisfied uh, with where we're at, Father. We'd be thankful and content in a certain sense of the word for what you've done. But what about tomorrow? What about next week, Lord? Hallelujah. Lord, I pray you'd challenge each of us in our spirit, man, Lord to uh, just move forward, Lord. Take back what the enemy may have taken right now. God, to be aggressive in the faith, to be zealous for God, Lord, and zealous for the works of God, Lord. Would you touch each one of us, Lord, from head to toe, from heart inside, Lord God. Help us, Jesus. Lord, send fresh fire on our life and our walk with God in our ministry to the Lord. Lord, would you send fresh fire on the things we do with our hands, Lord Jesus. God, we, we want to be ambitious for God, hallelujah. We want to be that lion of God, Lord, Hallelujah. For your glory, because you are the Lion of Judah. We serve you, and you're not up in the sky somewhere. You're in our hearts. So we praise you, and thank you, Lord. Steer up that zeal of God. Steer up that fire of God in our spirit, man, Lord, for, for Australia and for the nations that some of these ministries also touch. Uh, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen.